My name is Professor Philip Clark, and I would like to welcome you to this course, Integrating Economic Evaluation into Clinical Trials. In this first session, we will introduce key health economic concepts and provide an overview of economic evaluation. First, I would like to provide an overview of the entire course. The first session will look at key health economic concepts and methods for economic evaluation, including cost effectiveness analysis. The second session will look at measuring health related quality of life and other outcomes that are used in economic evaluation. The third session will look at how one collects relevant cost data and uses it in economic evaluation. The fourth session will focus on cost effectiveness analysis as a part of economic evaluation, as well as modeling and how one might capture uncertainty around estimates. The final session will provide some detailed examples and then discuss how you might get projects funded, you might find a health economist, and also finally, will provide a practical overview of where health economic evaluation is used to determine whether a high cost medication should be funded or not. Here are the key learning objectives for session one. Firstly, we provide an example of why it is important to integrate economic evaluation alongside clinical trials. Secondly, we want you to appreciate why economic evaluation of healthcare and public health interventions is important and should be an integral part of conducting clinical and other studies to evaluate new interventions. Thirdly, we will discuss the different types of economic evaluation that are commonly used. And finally, we will focus on the most commonly used method of cost effectiveness and examine how you can use an incremental cost effectiveness ratio to evaluate an intervention, whether it be a drug therapy, a new technology or a public health intervention. So session one is divided into a series of parts. The first session, looks at why we do economic evaluation alongside trials and provides some foundations of what is economics and what are the problems we face in allocating resources. The second part introduces economic evaluation and focuses on how one might design an economic evaluation and the inf information required. Finally, we introduce the concept of cost effectiveness analysis and show how it can be used in practice. The module concludes with an exercise, which we will discuss later. Welcome to part two of session one on the introduction to key health economic concepts. My name is José Lial and I'm an associate professor at the University of Oxford. We'll start by having a brief introduction to economic evaluation. The premise for an economic evaluation is that we have scarce healthcare resources and our aim is to maximize the health gain with the available resources. And we do this by comparing the cost and effectiveness of different interventions. So by definition, an economic evaluation is the comparative analysis of alternative courses of action in terms of both their costs and their consequences. So this provides an explicit and objective way of making choices concerning healthcare resources, and as a result provides an alternative allocation system to a market. There are several different types of economic evaluation. The cost component is the same across the different types, but how we measure effectiveness, i.e. the outcomes, this differs, and this is what determines the type of study. In a cost-consequence analysis, we report multiple outcomes in a disaggregated manner, and it's up to the decision makers to interpret, synthesize, and weight the different outcomes as appropriate. In a cost minimization analysis, we assume that health outcomes are identical for all treatments under consideration. 
So what we do is we compare the costs and we choose the least costly option to be implemented. However, these types of studies are rarely appropriate and they are not considered to be full economic evaluations. And this is because we need to consider the joint distribution of costs and effects, as will be discussed uh, later in another module. Then we have cost effectiveness analysis. So here we measure health outcomes in natural units and we calculate an incremental cost effectiveness ratio. That is an incremental cost per life year gained or in an incremental cost per additional case detected. Cost utility analysis is recommended by most health technology assessment agencies worldwide. Here, states of health, which are less than full health, so ill health, disability, are converted into healthy years. And the main technique of conversion is the use of quality adjusted life years or qualis. However, disability adjusted life years or DALIs are also an alternative to qualis. So what these metrics do is that they directly capture both the quantity, the longevity duration of life, and quality of life. How do qualities work? This figure shows a quality adjusted life profile of a person without an intervention and with an intervention. The number of qualities is calculated by multiplying a person's life expectancy, represented in the x-axis as years of life lived, by the value of the quality of life experienced in each period, represented in the y-axis, measured by an index score of 1 or less, where 0 is equivalent to death and 1 is full health. Scores can be less than 0 for health states regarded as worse than death. Let's look at the differences in these two health profiles. First, time to first event is longer with the intervention and there is a gain of about one year of life with the, inter the intervention. We can also see that there are fewer events with the intervention resulting in a better quality of life experienced with it. A quality is able to capture all these differences in a single metric and the gain in qualities within intervention is given by the shaded area. In session 2, we will discuss qualities in much greater detail. Economic evaluations are comparative. We always compare one intervention with another to calculate incremental costs and effects. This may include multiple comparators such as different statins or doses of statins. However, it is vital to choose appropriate comparators for the study question. For example, analysis that use a competitor that's not relevant for the UK is one of the main sources of uncertainty in nice technology appraisal decisions for cancer drugs. And this uncertainty can lead the appraisal committee being unable to recommend the drug for routine use in the National Health Service. So appropriate comparators here comprise the treatments that are most likely to be replaced by the therapy that you are evaluating. For example, we should use the current market leader in hypertension if we are analyzing first new line of treatment for hypertension or no treatment or palliative care if we are looking at a condition and a treatment for a condition for which most patients receive no therapy or there is currently no treatment available. So how does the cost effectiveness framework works? So we have one intervention, here intervention one, might be the new treatment, 
and we estimate its costs and its effectiveness per patient. And we compare this with intervention two, maybe best current clinical practice, maybe the leader of the market, maybe no treatment. And we estimate the costs and effectiveness per patient associated with that intervention. And then we estimate an incremental cost effectiveness ratio or an ICER, which consists of the difference in costs divided by the difference in effects. Let's look at the incremental cost effectiveness ratio or ICER and its interpretation using the cost effectiveness plane. Point C in the center is the starting point. This is the world with only the existing treatment in place, or the comparator as we know it. In an economic evaluation, we estimate where the new treatment is located in the plane relative to the center, or the comparator. So the x-axis gives us its comparative effectiveness, and the y-axis gives us its comparative cost. So if the new treatment is to the right of the y-axis, it's more effective. If it's to the left of the y-axis, it's less effective than the comparator. And if the new treatment is above the x-axis, then it's more costly than the comparator. And if it's below the x-axis, it is cheaper than the comparator. So there are four alternative scenarios where the new treatment might be located, corresponding to the four quadrants of the graph. The first two are the most clear-cut. So we might have the new treatment in the northwest quadrant, so being more costly and less effective, or we might have the new treatment in the southeast quadrant, where it's less costly and more effective. So here, in these two quadrants, the decision is quite easy to make. Either the, the new treatment dominates and should be implemented if it's in the southeast quadrant, or is dominated by the existing treatment as it is in the northwest west quadrant and should not be implemented. No need to estimate an answer. May also have the new treatments uh, being either less costly but less effective as in the southwest quadrant, or more effective but more costly as in the northeast quadrant. In these two quadrants, the decision is not as straightforward. Either treatment could be chosen, depending on the maximum that we are willing to spend or the minimum saving we are willing to accept for a given amount of effectiveness gained or lost. This is represented by the maximum acceptable incremental cost effectiveness ratio line here, which could be, for example, 20,000 pounds per quality gained. Now, this line is very useful to interpret the results of an economic evalu evaluation. If the new treatment is below the line, then it's cost effective and should be implemented. And if the, the new treatment is above the line, then it's not cost effective and should not be implemented. So, for example, if a new treatment is represented by this red dot and is located here, then we can see that it is cost effective because it's, it is below the line and as a result should be implemented. We'll now look at how to design an economic evaluation and the information required to produce results. It is important to consider the following when designing an economic evaluation. First is the target audience. Typically, it will be a decision maker, for example, NICE in England, conducting a technology appraisal or defining clinical guidelines. Then it's about defining the objectives of the analysis. We want to conduct a cost effectiveness analysis, a cost utility analysis, or any other type of economic evaluation. 
Then is the research question. You need to answer questions about what is the target population, what is the intervention, who is providing it, what it consists of, where it is provided, and to whom it is given. You also need to consider the comparators to include in the analysis. And finally, we need to think about the perspective or viewpoint of the analysis, whether it is confined to the healthcare system, sometimes referred as the payer, or whether it includes broader societal uh, costs. In terms of other considerations when designing an economic evaluation, it is important to involve the health economist as early as possible so that they can inform the design of the clinical trial, but also to prepare a detailed economic analysis plan to be filed as part of the trial, which is called the health economics analysis plan. Another point is that pragmatic effectiveness trials are best for economic studies. These offer an opportunity to evaluate the cost effectiveness of a treatment under real world conditions, compared to explanatory trials designed primarily to answer questions about safety and efficacy. And finally, it is important to think about whether there is a need to extrapolate or not the clinical trial results. Health economics guidelines state that the follow-up should be long enough to capture all relevant costs and benefits. This may mean that certain trials will need extrapolation to meet the requirements of the guidelines. If that is the case, then this should be budgeted appropriately and the extrapolation methods should then follow the best practice guidelines as well. To inform an economic evaluation alongside a clinical trial, you need to identify and measure all relevant resources, costs and health outcomes associated not only with the treatment but also with their impact on the natural history of disease. And we need to tailor these to the needs of the decision maker that we're trying to inform. For example, if we're informing NICE in England, we want to ensure that we can obtain quality adjusted life years as one of the outcomes of the trial. Furthermore, the decision makers are likely to have best practice guidelines for conducting economic evaluations they will want to ensure that we follow. The resource use and outcomes are collected using self-reported patient questionnaires at, at baseline and pre-specified time points during the follow-up of the trial. This can be collected during face-to-face -face interviews, via postal, via electronic means, and so on. And it's also important to consider whether we would like to link the patients to healthcare administrative data sets to minimize the recall bias associated with self-reported questionnaires. Most cost-effectiveness results for new interventions often lie in the northeast quadrant of the cost-effectiveness plane. In order to inform reimbursement decisions on the new interventions, we need to know what the maximum incremental cost-effective ratio is that suggests an intervention to be cost-effective. We need to know how to, to estimate this maximum threshold. Arbitrary rules of thumb are used in several countries to define a maximum acceptable ICER. For example, in England, NICE's methods guidance states that in general, interventions with an ICER of less than £20,000 per quality gains are considered to be cost-effective. Above an ICER of £30,000 per quality gains, 
advisory bodies will need to make an increasingly stronger case for supporting the intervention as an effective use of NHS resources. In Ireland, this range is 20 to 45,000 euros, and in Canada, this range is 20 to 100,000 Canadian dollars. However, these ranges are not strictly adhered to, and some would argue, argue that the lower bound estimates are too high and their use will not lead to efficient decisions. We can also look at past decisions to determine the maximum threshold, or ICER. And here we have an example from work conducted by Deccan et al. Looking at decisions by NICE, with those that led to a recommendation of implementation of the treatment in blue and the rejection in red. And what these researchers uh, found is that the proportion of interventions rejected by NICE increased with the ICER around 27 to 47,000 um, pounds per quality. And they also show that other factors are taken into account besides the ICER when deciding to implement or not uh, in intervention. The World Health Organization advocates an alternative approach for developing countries to estimate the maximum threshold. This approach relates the maximum acceptable ICER to a country's gross domestic product or GDP per capita. If the ICER of intervention is lower than the value of GDP per capita, the intervention is considered very cost effective. If the ICER of the intervention is between one times and three times the value of GDP per capita, the intervention is considered cost effective. If the ICER of the intervention is higher than three times the value of GDP per capita, the intervention is considered to be not cost effective. Given the ranges of threshold values and arguments for and against being explicit about them, we recommend the cost effectiveness results to be presented to decision makers so that they can weigh up the costs, benefits and other considerations to help them decide which intervention to adopt and reimburse. In this section of our session, we're going to look at cost effectiveness analysis in practice. So the first example is from the CISO trial economic analysis, which compared subacromial decompression versus no surgery for subacromial pain in the shoulder and found that decompression was more expensive than no surgery about 1,691 pounds per patient, but it resulted in higher qualities, about 0 0.08 qualities more per patient compared to no surgery. So the ISO is estimated by dividing the difference in costs by the difference in qualities, and that's estimated at 21,138 pounds. The other example is from the TopCat trial. So this trial compared partial versus total knee replacement in patients with medial compartment osteoarthritis of the knee at five years. And what they found was that the partial knee was uh, cheaper than total knee replacement at five years of follow-up. About 910 pounds cheaper per patient. And it was also associated with, with more qualities than total knee replacement. 0 0.240 per patient. So this placed the um, partial knee replacement in the southeast quadrant, cheaper and more effective than the total knee replacement. 
So let's revisit the quasi effect in this plane and place the results of the trial. So we have the line um, of 20,000 pounds per quality as being the line defining whether an intervention is cost effective or not, as recommended by NICE. So we accept if the interventions are below the line and re reject if they are above. And we see that CISO is placed in the northeast quadrant, so it was more effective but more costly than current practice. And the results of the top cats of the partial knee replacement placed it in the southeast quadrant. So it was more effective and uh, cheaper than total knee replacement. So both of these interventions were then cost effective and as a re result recommended for implementation. So let's recap. Why do we conduct economic evaluations? Well, first to inform decisions. We know that information on effectiveness alone is not sufficient to make decisions. Costs should also be explicitly considered. We can't forget that we need to maximize the health outcomes of the population within a given funding and budget. We also conduct economic evaluations to answer questions of how does the intervention compare to other in terms of costs and consequences. Is it cost effective? And we also conduct economic evaluations to help translate study re results into information for decision and policymakers, to provide evidence based within uh, your field and to inform government funding agencies as well. We reached the end of part two on the introduction to key health economic concepts. So next is the exercise for this session. Thank you.